Hello and welcome. I'm your host Petri, and this show helps you to build your company. In this episode, we're looking back in order to look ahead. I'm talking with Johan Nurberg, whose latest book, Open, The Story of Human Progress, has just been released. It's one of the most important and timely books. I would call it the book of the year. We talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, failure, and success, and much more. Let's get started. Hey, Johan, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Not bad at all. I'm just thinking why we have to always fail in order to succeed. Because I think that uh, a- any type of uh, learning process must be built on experiments and often crazy experiments to go any further. You know why, why nightingales sing so well? Researchers recently looked into this. You know, nightingales up here in the north, they don't want to spend the winter time here. They move to Africa then for a while. And the interesting thing is that the researchers have found that they keep on singing. Male nightingales keep on singing in Africa, even though they don't fight over the the females there. They don't fight over territory or anything. So why do they do it? Well, they've learned that they sing in weird ways, crazy ways, new syllables and noises, and most of it doesn't make any sense. And it turns out that the nightingales, they spend the winter time experimenting with new wow. strange noises and new songs. And most of them fail miserably. <laughs> they, they don't make any sense, wouldn't attract any female nightingale. But once in a while, they find that great pitch. And then they return to Sweden or Finland, and they sing that great song, and they get new territory and lots of females. And, and that's how they win out in the end. So if even the nightingales have to experiment and most of the time fail to make progress, well, then I think it makes even more sense for humans to do it. In your latest book, you're also saying that Homo sapiens is basically just an entrepreneur by another name. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think we are traders by nature. Uh, We've come this far only because we innovate and we imitate. And that's the two things that really sets us apart from, well, even the nightingales and everybody else in the animal kingdom. We have an amazing ability of uh, systematizing knowledge that we learn from our experiments and our failures and to learn from each other and to imitate the others and, and the great ideas that they have so that anytime we someone stumbles onto a better idea, we, we all learn from it. You know, we compared to the animals, we, we're not very quick, we're not very strong, we don't have a natural panther, we can't even fly. Uh, we were bad at swimming, but we do have something else. We have each other and the ability to borrow and steal the best ideas and insights from others and combine it with our own and then move forward. I find I think it, you call that in the book as a culture. That's the definition of culture, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's this is really this is cultural evolution. I mean, every animal has this natural evolution whereby um, the body and the instincts and what have you develops and, and in some sort of adapting to the environment. But then, thanks to three things that developed specifically in human beings, intelligence, communication, and cooperation, we step onto the, the new level of cultural evolution. You can see that in your mirror. When you look yourself into the mirror, you can see why we are superior. Uh, because we actually have whites in our eyes. We have uh, white sclera uh, surrounding uh, the cornea of the eye. And that sets us apart from the other animals, you know, chimpanzees and the other apes. They have brown sclera, so as to hide their gaze from others. In contrast, human beings, at some point in our evolution, we started to benefit from broadcasting our attention to others. Whereas the chimpanzee wants to hide if they find, look, there's prey to eat or a potential partner. They want to hide it so that they can get it for themselves and nobody else steals it. 
But because of our ability to cooperate, uh, it makes sense that everybody else notices when I look at a potential prey, for example, uh, or a predator, because then we can cooperate in encircling it, throwing stones at it, and thereby we we can make much faster progress than everybody else and learn from what everybody else is seeing and doing. So then we can accumulate so much knowledge and whenever anybody stumbles onto something that improves the world, well, the rest of the world can learn from that as well. What was the most surprising thing you learned while you were doing research for the book? In a way, the thing, the, the big surprise that I built a lot of the book around is about a previous misunderstanding that I had about the world, where I thought of modern development, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and onwards, liberal democracy as a very Western Eurocentric uh, development. And that's because, just like so many others, I started to read history in reverse. Because it happened here, I wanted to find so what were the, the stepping stones and the ladders that we climbed to to reach this place. And then obviously it's not difficult to find it. You that's sort of the Renaissance and the Italian city-states and uh, Magna Carta and the Roman Empire and the Greeks. And there you have it. One nice single trajectory that puts <laughs> put us put us here. Uh, but then when I started to read history, I, I stumbled on to a couple of problems with this uh, attempt to, to read history. One of them being that I had to explain away 1,000 years where basically nothing happened in Europe. We even went into reverse our... Uh, our development, our scientific knowledge, our, our uh, commerce, and, and so on. Um, and also the fact that these things, these stepping stones, these ladders, so to speak, they happened in almost every other culture historically. And that was a little bit trou troubling for my, to my perspective. I could see that it happened in pagan cultures, it happened in Confucian cultures, it happened in uh, the Muslim Abbasid Caliphate, and it happened in, uh, in Catholic and Protestant um, places. And the Song Dynasty in China 1,000 years ago, when Europe was so poor that most of it wasn't even interesting to, to raid for, for nomads on horseback. Uh, at that time, the Chinese Song Empire already uh, had uh, the, the nautical compass, the printing press, and um, they fought with gunpowder. The three inventions that Karl Marx thought ushered in Western bourgeois capitalism, uh, writing in the 1860s. So that tells you that we've had golden eras everywhere. Uh, throughout history. It's just that in most places, they were destroyed by the establishment and by reactionary um, backlashes. It didn't happen in Europe. And that's what set us apart, not any sort of simple trajectory. But it was not because of lack of trying. That's what I learned from the book as well. There was obviously these incumbents and people in power who wanted to keep things because it was so good for them. But yeah. But you, yes. you can probably explain, you know, how that happened because I think that was really fascinating. I, I think I can see parallels for for what's happening here at this point as well. But let's check the history. Yeah, it's in every single culture there is something called Cardwell's law after the technology historian Donald Cardwell, uh, and it says that innovation always faces resistance from the groups that think they stand to lose from it. And that's often political and religious elites who think that their power is threatened or the old businesses with old technologies and, and workers, guilds and trade unions who don't want any sort of innovation. So there's always this tension within every culture between open and closed. And then in certain places that backlash, that Cardwellian law, that uh, it faces so much resistance that it's destroyed. Um, but in some places, it managed to survive. Often we think that sort of there must be something about the European elites, religious and political and commercial elites uh, you know, during the Renaissance, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, that uh, they must have been wise or thought about things more long term than in other places. But no, when you look at the record, they fought just as hard as the Chinese emperors and the uh, caliphs and the uh, uh, 
robber barons in other cultures. It's just that the European elites were much worse <laughs> at doing this. They, they, they failed. They couldn't keep up with that innovation. And that's partly just because of luck, because Europe was a more decentralized place with more independent political entities, independent cities, universities, uh, and always some sort of rivalry between them, which meant that when the Chinese emperor thought that now we are being threatened by this innovation, let's stop it. Well, then a whole continent uh, abided by his ruling. But when the French king said the same thing, the troublemakers could always move across the border, move into the Dutch Republic or to England. It was always difficult to coordinate oppression and uh, repression in, in Europe. I think one of the most fascinating examples in history is how China gave up it's uh, the, the greatest armada that the world had ever seen. You know, they traveled the world half a century before Columbus did. They With the bigger boats. Yeah, ex- they were enormous, were they? Like 200 much, meters or 150 at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the flagship of Zheng He, uh, they, I think it was some 135 meters compared to Columbus, uh, Santa Maria, 20 meters. Uh, so basically the rudder of Zheng He's uh, flagship was bigger than <laughs> the whole of Columbus boat. Uh, but that whole venture, they could have discovered the, the new world, was all shut down because of a power struggle within um, in, among the rulers in China. And the emperor just said, stop. And the greatest armada that the world has had ever seen rotted and some of it was burnt. Uh, and and some tried to do that in Europe as well. They weren't that interested in vest- sort of pumping lots of resources into these dangerous and risky ventures. Uh, Columbus had a hard time <laughs> sort of trying to find his his westward road to to Asia as well. He couldn't find anyone in his own Italy to sponsor his trip. So he asked the Portuguese king. And the Portuguese king said, no, that's stupid. <laughs> Let's not do that. Had this been China, that would have been the end of it. But he could continue in a fragmented Europe to search for sponsors. So he went to England and to France, and he was turned down again. And he went going from king to king for some 20 years until eventually the Spanish king said, yeah, why not? Let's try this. And the rest, of course, is history. This is exactly like the... Another day in a startup life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 20 years of doing, going from king to king or investor to investor. Knocking on doors and nothing is working and everybody is against you. Nobody wants to do, you know, nobody is sort of interested in what you're doing because it's too weird, too strange. So at, you just uh, keep on pushing. Exactly. At least you can take some comfort in the fact that you don't have one single person to go to, the, the Chinese emperor where you have to kowtow to him and, and try to impress him. There are alternatives. While you were doing research, did you find out how close it was, You know how, how sort of a, a dangerous was the situation? That uh, Because when China closed down, it was Chinggis Khan who basically just uh, took... Uh, the, bits and pieces from all the cultures and didn't he actually then bring it back to Europe and and you know the all the all the developments which were happening so has has there been sort of like a close, close calls in a sense that we could basically lose all of the knowledge or most of the knowledge become like Tasmanians yes it has been very close and i would say that um probably sometime late 16th century and uh, early uh, 17th century, it was uh, very close that Europe went the same way as these other cultures that failed. And that was because then it was fairly close that a single um, house, royal house, got control over the whole continent. And this was then the um, Habsburg family. And they reigned on so many different thrones at that time. They were in um, Spain and they controlled then Belgium and and the Dutch and they um, controlled the Holy Roman Empire and Austria and so on. And um, they were fairly close in um, attacking and submitting uh, France to its rule as well. And at that point, some historians say 
it, we could have gone the same way because then they would have oppressed uh, in in a synchronized fashion across the, the whole continent. The um, the Thirty Years' War at the same time it almost ruined Germany and Austria and wasn't much left there. We saw an increased oppression from both Protestants and Calvinists and. Uh, and Catholics have tried to to keep it up with with others and independent-minded eccentrics like Giordano Bruno uh, was killed and uh, famously Galileo Galilei had to uh, apologize for for his thoughts. So it was close. We were saved, perhaps in this version of the story. Perhaps it it wouldn't have worked long term anyway, but we might have been saved by the Dutch because the Dutch. T- the Dutch, they rebelled against the Habsburgs at, at this time. They didn't like the idea that um, the Spanish Inquisition and the high taxes were coming for them. So they rebelled and they um, started to fight back. And for a, during a couple of decades, they, through innovation in finance and in shipbuilding, they managed to create the uh, out of nothing. Basically, they they had nothing. They didn't even have land. They had to build it with shovels, um, and but with innovative methods and commerce, they built the richest country on the planet. And they fought back the Habsburgs and created an independent Dutch Republic. And because of that, they also um, they basically invaded uh, England in 1688. The English, they, the British, they don't want to admit to this, but that's actually what happened during the Glorious Revolution, because England and France were very close to an alliance to destroy the independent-minded Dutch. But uh, then William of Orange, the Dutch leader, he invaded uh, England with more than 400 ships, and um, with the help of uh, the the British Parliament. Um, But that sort of saved England from the possibly authoritarian despotism of the Stuart kings. And, um, and then England became more Dutch and was more open for the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution as well. In the book, you also mentioned that the Dutch fleet was enormous. It, it was bigger than what was 50 million other nations together. There was uh, German, France, and, and was it Spain as well, at least. And 1.5 million people managed to do that. I'm actually sitting now in a place which is pretty much the 1.5 million, Estonia. And Estonia is kind of leading the digital revolution from the government side. So could Estonia be the new Dutch in a way that now we're entering to the digital uh, area in really because of Corona this year, kickstarted this, this phenomenon that we know everybody's pretty much isolated and, and now we need to do virtually everything and the nation borders and the physical locations don't matter that much. Do you think there's something like that happening or do you see anything from the history that we could maybe learn or see that could happen? Well, yes, this is the lesson of history. It's not about numbers. It's about um, what those <laughs> numbers represent in terms of of uh, innovation and uh, ability to to create the new. Um, the the Dutch they were one point five million people, but they managed to create a fleet that was bigger than the combined fleets of Spain, Portugal, France, England, and Germany, with a combined population of something like 50 million people. And the difference was that the Dutch had institutions that made it possible for innovative and eccentric people to come up with new ideas and then quickly to find, uh, through decentralized sources, funding for them and to put them into practice. So for example, they had better shipbuilding techniques. They reduced the time of of cutting beams by something like um, 90% and they did it at half the cost. Whereas in all those other places, in Spain, Portugal, France, England, and Germany, they protected the old shipbuilders with uh, through guilds and uh, regulations. And therefore they weren't as innovative and therefore the Dutch could 
resist a simultaneous French and English invasion in the 1670s. And I think that tells us something about a country like Estonia today. It's not really... I mean, there's some strength in numbers, obviously. Um, the, the more people, the more people that are have, can stumble on to new ideas. But if you are open, if your systems are open and your minds are open, then you can make look to the rest of the world through exchange and communication and constantly being um, in tune with what goes on in other places and use and borrow and steal and uh, their ideas and combine it with your own. So then I think the openness of a place like Estonia could be the decisive factor in the long run. Oftentimes, actually, if you are, if there are fewer of you and perhaps even feeling a little bit vulnerable uh, close to major powers, that sharpens minds a little bit and uh, it makes you perhaps a little bit more open to innovative ideas that can make you more powerful. Was that the case with Dutch as well? I think they took quite a bit of immigrants. So it was not just that they did all the brilliant things. They just uh, got a lot of other people to help them. And that was the inno innovative platform, if you will. Uh, this is the same thing in Estonia. It's a tiny place. The local market is so tiny that you cannot do anything here. You know, if you want to have any success, you have to go immediately abroad. So the mindset is exactly that. You you have to go elsewhere, and and there's not much here to do by itself. Is this the only way to actually make this happen, or are there actually in 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 history lessons where you could? come from a rich environment and not sort of out of necessity. Could it be Norway? They have all the oil money and you know, it's not exactly the necessity to do things in a sense for some other places in the world. Yeah, I think that it's, it's not the resources you have. It's not even the people you have. It's, it's what you do with it. And again, go back in history to uh, to the Dutch. Everybody thought that they would fail because they were few. <laughs> At first, just one million. So they got 500,000 uh, immigrants and increased their population that way. They didn't have any natural resources. They didn't even have land, but they had openness to new ideas and to uh, openness to surprises. And that works, that functions uh, everywhere where you um, create these links through with, with the rest of the world. And back then, it was often a republic of letters where your most innovative thinkers and uh, engineers began to correspond through the new commercial postal system uh, with, uh, with people in, in other parts of the world and thereby accumulating more ideas and knowledge. Now, obviously, you can do that better with digital technology. The one thing that doesn't work is oil money, I think. Uh, that's the, the having too much natural resources, that's that's bad for you in, in several different ways. One of them is that it poisons every discussion. I can't enter a taxi from the Oslo airport without facing a discussion with the driver about what to do with the oil money. So it focuses people on the wrong things, on distribution, on spending rather than on creation. And also there's always this temptation uh, and, and, and vulnerability that this uh, destroys other sectors of the economy because... Uh, Talent and resources goes into that sector, and also it then has an effect on your currency. So it gets more difficult for other exports than that the particular one. Uh, oftentimes, those countries with too much resources just end up fighting over the spoils uh, instead of creating new ones. Now, Norway was lucky because they they found oil a long time after they had created stable institutions of rule of law and democracy. So they just made it, they survived. But it's it's not for everybody because it, it often poisons your culture. You've been traveling quite a bit, doing internationally, globally things for many years, decades. Can you give some advice, knowing so much about history and knowing that we are quite having a bit of a 
challenges at this year, starting the new decade. And sometimes it's a good time to start new businesses. Sometimes it's a good time to build new things when there's a lot of volatility in the market and, and in also in the political systems and around the world. What is the good place to have as a base? If I could move anywhere in the world now, where, where should I start my business? What is a good base to build something? I could actually probably get people around the world now. They can live wherever they like, but you know, where should I head? Is it Europe? Or are we going to the, what happened to China after the uh, Song Dynasty? Well, Estonia is not a bad place to be, I would say, with the kind of mindset that exists there compared to, to many other places. Um, I think the problem with much of Europe is that it's so fixated on past triumphs old empires uh, that were successful now being somewhat nostalgic and fighting to protect their old model. And that makes sense from a human perspective. You you want to do that, obviously, but that might make it difficult to, for you to reach the next level and to, to see the new opportunities that are being created. Estonia doesn't have that. It's a much younger generation with a better spirit, I, I would say. But I think there are countries like that all over uh, the world. But the great risk as a business, as a country, as a um, household, is that you become sort of used to your own successes and they devour you. They destroy you because you constantly want to repeat the same kind of, of thing. And that's how many great societies and businesses have been undermined historically. You you want to protect the old. I mean, it's it's so easy to become the Kodak of the world, uh, destroyed by the digital camera. And then, obviously, the the great irony of that story is that uh, Kodak was one of the pioneers with a digital camera. Um, they had it. They could do it. They could develop it. But they just thought, nah. That's not our business model. We make most money by just selling film to to uh, analog cameras, and and that I think is what we do in all our societies: sort of protect what we've already created in a great way. Um, unfortunately, then that might leave us all as Kodaks in the long run, because sooner or later someone else is going to pick up that digital camera develop it and turn it into something better and then you will be destroyed uh, so perhaps it's better if you destroy your own business model than if you let yourself be destroyed by others have you been studying africa lately is that the new golden opportunity for everyone i think it's when, when i talk to people in in several african countries they tell me that they are surprised that so few Europeans go there and they're telling me that the Chinese do obviously Chinese the Chinese government and Chinese businesses in a big way but not just that it's also kind of the Chinese backpackers almost looking for new opportunities in a scary wild environment um, where it seems difficult and dangerous to make headway. Uh, but obviously, that's where you can make enormous profits in the long run if it works out right. Uh, it's a very difficult and uh, unstable political situation in so many countries. And that's the reason why we avoid it. But that's also what makes it interesting. And to me, at least, it's somewhat depressing that we don't see a younger generation of Europeans making the same kind of choices. Sweden, I think, is quite a peculiar case. Sweden was really poor some hundred years back, and then it became the, one of the richest countries in the world and had one of the lowest taxes as well, tax rates and, and a lot of success. And then something else happened as well. Uh, the welfare state kicked in. But now you, Sweden has been renewing again How can you do that? Can you explain? Because I think that's quite exceptional. Or am I mistaken here? I, I just have missed all the other nations who can do the same thing. <laughs> no, I think you summarized it in, uh, in a good way. It's not unique, but perhaps Sweden is a little bit more extreme than others. Because we basically went from until 1850, basically. We were poorer than other countries and more heavily uh, government intervention into the economy and then we opened up faster and more than 
uh, almost any other country. And uh, radical deregulation and uh, opening up of the economy. And then we had 100 years of rapid economic growth, faster than any other country than, than Japan. And then we became more extreme in the other way again, thinking that, look, now we've built all this wealth. So let's just begin to redistribute it and thinking about how to consume it. And it was a miserable failure because suddenly the country that had uh, grown faster than any other country began to lag behind the others rapidly. And we didn't create a single net job in the private sector for almost 40 years. When we saw the result of that, and especially in the great financial crisis of the early 1990s in Sweden, from the left to the right, uh, politicians agreed that, wow, this was a spectacular failure. Uh, let's not do this again. Let's go in the total opposite direction. And then there was a consensus on opening up Sweden again, deregulating lower taxes, and we got back to more of an entrepreneurial Sweden again. And it's not that different from what other countries have done, but we've done it faster and more dramatic in every step, in every uh, part of this uh, long history. And I think that tells you something about Sweden, that we are, we have a tradition of looking for consensus. You don't want to... Uh, be the odd man out in a country like Sweden. We a tradition of homogenous uh, a population of uh, small property owning farmers. You want to be like the neighbors. So when they became socialists, you want to be a socialist. When they became um, radical, laissez-faire liberals, you want to as well. So it's like we have these more dramatic turns. It's more difficult to find critics and to be accepted by others when you critique the uh, order of the day. Uh, but once a sufficient number of people have changed their mind, you want to change as well. And I think that sets Sweden apart, a little bit apart from other countries. That's really fascinating uh, to see also that uh, Scandinavia Nordics are pretty much leading the innovation in the startup field in the, in the global scale as well, if you look to Europe. Obviously, US is leading uh, in the total numbers, but they are sucking people in from all over the world and everybody's moving there. To Most of the people are at least used to be doing that, immigrating and, and going to Silicon Valley and then listing their companies and selling them there. But Sweden has been really powerful in that sense as well. And uh, is it cultural? Or is it the immigrants? Because I, I don't think, you know, Finns are doing the same. It's, it's not exactly the, the Danes uh, and uh, certainly not the Norwegians. So what is it in your drinking water? <laughs> I think there is something cultural. And I think that is a result of having been a very trade-dependent country for a long time. Lots of imports, lots of exports. We learned early on that our big businesses, our major multinational companies that were all, you know, the old manufacturing kind that were all created some 130 years ago, they were dependent on openness. We were too small a country to come up with the best ways of creating steel or uh, telephones, but we can, could borrow it from other places. And we had too few consumers to, um, to rely on our domestic markets. So we had to go abroad. We had to be constantly in tuned, attuned to what was going on in other places. So there's some cultural link there, some sort of, even when we were a fairly politically close society, we were, we had open minds to what was going on. And Still, it's the case that when international companies want to try new products, they often try Sweden because we're fairly early adopters. And when you have eyes that wide open to what's going on in other places, in an almost uh, at sometimes a little bit uh, nervous fashion, you're afraid that you might miss the next big thing, uh, then it gets easier to catch the next wave and to integrate the ideas that are being presented elsewhere and that comes 
with the uh, the business travelers and the immigrants and the outsiders and to make them your own. And the moment we started again then to open up the economy in the 1990s, there was a, um, they could begin to turn those ideas that they often borrowed elsewhere and uh, they, um, they could build new major companies again. They, I mean, the Skypes, Spotify, King, Mojang, and so on. It seems that uh, a lot of the nation states are closing down now. They're building walls, uh, if not physical, then they're putting some other types of walls around them. And this is catching like a virus, pun intended, I guess. Um, how do you see this decade going? Are we now globally going to close down? Or where are the new Dutch cities? What is is there hope to have this new renaissance coming? Or how, how do you make sense of this mess? You know where we are at this point, looking you know forward the next five ten years. Yeah, this is a scary moment in time, and it reminds me of historical episodes where those golden eras in certain cultures began to feel the forces of of closed being uh, becoming more aggressive and they turned inward which resulted in nothing more than losing access to the brains and the skills and the innovations of other cultures and that was the beginning of the end for for those places um there is something similar going on right now the great backlash against globalization and uh, open societies generally uh, we can see both a radical left and a radical uh, populist right that have one thing in common that they don't like surprises they don't like diversity they don't like uh, the fact that we live in open societies where uh, what happens next could come from anywhere uh, they have a perfect plan for our future and and that's always very very scary i think this is this could be a transitory mo- uh, moment it could be a fleeting moment that just passes by i think those moments are often related to a sense of crisis for the old model historically often great depressions or invasions natural disasters or pandemics and in a way we have now um, been living in a perfect storm of crises like this. Uh, we've had the, the Great Recession, the financial crisis, an old political establishment, lost a lot of, of voters' trust. We had um, have a new geopolitical situation where it feels a little bit more scary to be Western than it used to. Terrorism, the migration crisis, we've had uh, the pandemic, and all these things traditionally lead us to being more closed-minded because we, when we become afraid of the world, it triggers a fight-or-flight instinct. We become a societal fight-or-flight instinct, basically. We want to pick fights with someone, with scapegoats or foreigners, or we want to hide behind walls and tariff barriers because traditionally that's how we survived a particular threat uh, because that particular threat was often a predator or a a raiding tribe. Um, Now, of course, it doesn't make sense because the threat is a virus or a lack of innovation or something like that. And then it doesn't make sense to sort of (laughs) to fight or or flee, uh, but rather to cooperate and to uh, find better ideas from strangers rather than uh, beating them up, uh, but tell that to our Stone Age brains. It's it's that's that's the difficult uh, thing, and then we become attracted to the demagogues, those who want to uh, tell us that they and only they can protect us against this dangerous world. When that happens in one place, it triggers the same instinct in other places. Everybody want to fight and flee in the same manner, and then. There's an era for an opportunity for authoritarians and populists. Now, often that doesn't um, sustain itself because something else happens. The economy gets back on track. The, uh, we manage to deal with the virus. We uh, have a new breed of politicians who manage to defend openness in a new and, and better way. And that's the end of it. But once in a while, the... Um, 
fence sitters, they who haven't made up their mind, they end up on the closed side and uh, begin to build those walls and create a more hostile international atmosphere and begin to stifle um, open minds and free speech. And that's the end of those civilizations. Let's let's hope that that's not one of the periods that we're in right now. Uh, the one thing that makes me an optimist about the world as a whole is that, um, I mean, the, the world is a little bit fragmented. We can screw up big time here, but there will be other countries in other places who will continue to make scientific progress, technological innovation and, uh, and great business progress. Um, so the good news is it's going to survive somewhere. The bad news is it might not be us. <laughs> And that's uh, a thing I picked from the book as well, that uh, sort of the defragment, it is good, because then then you have more robust, complex system totally overall, because there are more chances that somebody will make it, like what happened in the, in the Europe earlier, in the Industrial Reno- Revolution and the, and the Renaissance times. So, so I, I think that gives hope for us. And the overall tone of your book is obviously kind of optimistic but it's it's also you know at least i cannot avoid the fact that much of the progress is just by, by a lucky coincidences and, and uncertainty kicking in and you know it's not by the human uh you know cleverness it's just more like that you know we just couldn't you know do anything else and it just happened to us <laughs> yeah and this is something that never ceases to amaze me when you look at all the great things that we now, all of us agree, uh, create a better world for all of us. Everybody hated it originally. Uh, Nobody wanted it, almost, except a few eccentrics, uh, because we hadn't seen the proof that it works and will improve our world. We only saw that it threatened the old way of doing things. So it could be, I mean, the first vaccines, we, and we still see hostility against that. Um, everything from the credit card to internet, um, from the bicycle to to the car, uh, the great majority and the elite thought that this is worthless, impossible, or stupid. To um, uh, to quote a, um, a a management book with with the best book title ever, uh, and and had we had a vote. Should, uh, with everybody, should we apply um, these new technologies and goods and services? Obviously, everybody would say no. The the latest one I heard about recently was the uh, invention of the fork uh, to eat with. Uh, we had the knife all the time, but the fork was much more controversial. And the Pessimists Archive, one of the great uh, podcasts on in innovation, explained that uh, when the first forks arrived, people said, no, that's disgusting and it's immoral and it's dangerous. You might pick your uh, and hurt your mouth if you use it. And some said it's the work of the devil because it looked like one of his tools. And when President John Quincy Adams um, began to use a fork in the uh, in dining room of the White House in the 18. 18- 30s, I guess, were there. And um, people said, this is the end of the American democratic experiment because now we use <laughs> uh, and it's and, and obviously, it's hilarious to hear about how people feared new technologies and, and innovations. But we are not that different from them. We react in the same way when we hear about genetically modified crops or, well, gene editing or electronic scooters or whatever, because we always we can always imagine at the um when we sit in our own living room we can imagine great disasters coming from this and how it upends a traditional way of life but it's very difficult to see how it can be used in a good way and how people can deal with the the problems that will appear uh, sooner or later and and that's I think, an important insight about human nature. Progress comes from um, eccentrics, and it's only when they open up a crack in the great wall of of conservatism and manage to do it for a long time that the rest of us see that, oh, wait a minute, this this is pretty good. Let's let's use this uh, in... uh, 
and let's make sure that everybody gets access to it. Um, because that tells us something about our inherent uh, reactionary, the reactionary in, in all of us and, um, and why we have to restrain it uh, to, to leave room for progress. There was also this staggering statistics that 2.2% is the amount of social value, the original innovator, the entrepreneur is actually getting from the, whatever he's doing to enhance and improve the society. Is that, do you remember, is, is it basically looking back, you know, many decades, centuries, or is it just from the recent times that you only get that tiny amount of the total value creating yeah, uh, yeah this is uh, this is actually a, a quite shocking statistic it's from william nordhaus economist and nobel laureate who looked at um, innovative businesses what he called the schumpeterian profits after the austrian economist joseph schumpeter and his idea that uh, progress comes from creative destruction that we implement new technologies and business systems that um, uh, make the old ones obsolete. Looking at um, at recent decades, so where did the profits end up? Uh, the, the surplus that were was created, how much ended up in the pockets of the greedy entrepreneurs and how much ended up with uh, consumers and the rest of society with... Uh, savings and uh, the ability to produce more and uh, and his conclusion from this model that he's building is that something like 2.2 percent of the value of their innovation is given to the greedy entrepreneurs just two just a little bit than more than two percent despite their first mover advantage despite often patent protection uh, so it means that the rest of us just sitting at home watching Netflix and eating pizza, we got 98% of the profits from these new technologies and business systems that were created in better business models. Uh, because the profits for the entrepreneur is quickly competed away. Um, because it, it, almost immediately people start to imitate it and create something similar. But the benefits to the rest of society, that's that remains there uh, in place for for all of us which obviously uh, begs the question um why do they do it why do they work so hard and risk all their savings and alienate uh, friends and family by uh, working day and night to come up with strange new inventions and goods and services if if even if they're lucky they get 2% and the rest of the world who complain about their greed gets uh, 98% of it. Well, it must just be that they have an exaggerated belief in their own ability. <laughs> Isn't that one of the things that make entrepreneurs tick? Um, or it could be the joy of, of discovery and creation, that that's uh, so much. Or it could be, and I think... Uh, it comes down to a little bit of everything. If you manage to do it, if you manage to revolutionize a particular sector, create new revolutionary technologies, you create so much value, so many billions that even 2.2% of that makes it all worthwhile. Indeed. And also the one puzzle I never figured out is that maybe you can help me and, and, and tell me When you have made those successes, 2.2%, then maybe that's tens of millions or hundreds of millions or even billions in some few cases. What's the urge then to give it all back? <laughs> give back to the society. Can you explain that to me? This is a very strange phenomenon. And I hear it all the time from successful, successful businessmen. They say that, um, look, now I, I've... I've become so wealthy uh, through my endeavors, so now it's time to give something back to society and uh, to engage in, in charity and, and uh, or some other uh, projects. And uh, and that's just fine. If that's what you want to do, if you think this is the most uh, 
the best use of your resources to improve the world. That's great. But I will never understand this urge to, to think that after having been successful, you have to give something back to society. Wait a minute. You just created businesses and goods and services that created enormous value, 98% of which went to society. And you only got 2%. If anything, society should give something back to you. Uh, so I think this is the, the same kind of um, shame, the sense of shame that uh, religious and Marxist uh, thinkers have always tried to um, uh, attack business people with, that there's something bad about succeeding and about wealth in itself. And I think that's a great shame because the very fact of making profits means in a free market where you create, where you got those resources from people who voluntarily bought your goods and services, well, then making a profit is proof that you have given something to society. It's a proof that you have used certain resources, natural resources, the time of yourself and of workers, you have used them in a better way than anybody else could do at that time. You have made sure that those resources are being used in the most efficient way to give something to society, to consumers and to other businesses. That's that. You should be praised for doing that, not feel ashamed. And another thing related uh, is the other side of the coin. Uh, this is also, I'm now directly quoting from the book, two-thirds of the average person's material wealth is determined by where in the world they happen to work. Two-thirds. That's a huge. Imagine your quota somewhere in uh, Asia and or Africa or wherever. Two-thirds of your wealth is not dependent on your skills. It's dependent where you can work. Yeah. And that tells us something about the importance of the whole ecosystem of a functioning dynamic economy. It's not you alone. It's not what you have. It's how you can combine it with what everybody else has there. It's the the capital and the human capital in that society and definitely the institutions. Uh, if there are institutions like rule of law, safe property rights and freedom to to experiment and innovate that makes a huge difference so even if you have exactly the same kind of education and human capital um, depending on where you are it determines some two-thirds of the average person's material wealth because uh, it's not enough to be a um, brilliant uh, engineer or author or doctor if you are surrounded by uh, people who cannot create a, the complementary ability technology that makes your skills really valuable to other people um, and if we and that's one of the reasons why migration if it works out well is one of the quickest way of improving wealth in the world by making sure that people who lack opportunities in countries with bad institutions, if they can only move across the border to a place where it's better, uh, then they can increase their wealth by some two thirds. And that's why some economists talk about um, open migration uh, is really sort of trillion dollar uh, bills on on the pavement that we could just pick up by making sure that people end up in a place where their skills are really used to the best of, of their advantage. Do you think that's going to happen this decade? Because the physical location doesn't matter anymore. So technically, if you can, not all, obviously not all the jobs and all the work services can be provided remotely, but pretty many can be. So is that something you see that starts to happen or can happen or what other things you think can be also hindering that development yeah i think that uh, the, the the web and the digital world has made it possible for us not to kill distance but to at least uh, 
slightly uh, decrease its obstacles to making people meet. So anything that can be digitized, can we can now uh, work from a distance with one another and make it happen in a, in a better way. And that's obviously of, of great importance to, um, uh, to the whole world and to everybody involved. However, not everything can be digitized. And the, much of our service economy is based on things like uh, meeting other people. And, uh, you know, I mentioned doctors. Uh, you can, you have to be there uh, to, to a, a, at least some degree close to the patient. Oh, I would love uh, to have a you know, remote dentist. <laughs> <laughs> it, we're not quite there <laughs> not yet uh, but that dentist can obviously read up on uh, new knowledge about what goes on with teeth uh, even though that information comes from the other side of the world make use of um, technology that is being developed elsewhere um, but that meeting is necessary uh, so it's still mostly for information Uh, that uh, that we've reduced distance to to that extent. I also think that we've learned something from this pandemic. I mean, it's it's wonderful that it happened now and not 20 years ago, because then we can do podcasts like this and we can meet with our colleagues, associates, and friends uh, online. But at the same time, there's so far at least a lack of the kind of surprise meetings that often takes place in offices and cafes and uh, uh, lectures where you bump into people, where you suddenly hear those things that you didn't expect, where you're subtly surprised by the uh, talent and the charisma of, uh, of that particular person that you uh, didn't expect to meet and the kind of the water cooler. Okay, can I pause just a second because we have a mutual friend and he's been actually in the episode as well, Hampus Jakobson. Uh, he explained in the episode that he was uh, coming from New York, flying, I guess, to Europe. And he just uh, happened to have a professional clown next to him in the, in the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> things that only happen to hampers uh, <laughs> yeah that was just a side a quick comment that you know people who haven't uh, you know listened to that episode it's worth listening as well i'm not gonna tell what happened there so you have to listen to yourself but i think that i think that's but that's exactly what i'm talking about we need to meet that surprise clown on the plane once in a while because that broadens our perspective and if we only walk around in our online world where we just look for the things that we know that we're interested in there will be a lack of the serendipity that makes many great things happen and uh, i've met so many people who've told me that uh, their business uh, was the result of going to this sort of market fair, this uh, seminar thing where they thought that they were there to meet the speaker, but it was really the people that they met during coffee break that gave them this new insight or they changed business cards and then suddenly came up with the next thing to do. And we're not quite there when it comes to the digital world yet. We could be if we sort of uh, continue with virtual and uh, augmented reality and uh, continuing with some version of Star Trek's holodeck uh, where we can make use for that, where we can create openings for that serendipity. Uh, but so far, I don't think that Zoom and um, Google Meets are, Teams are getting us there. Going back a bit to the history, but not to the public history, more like a personal history. The way you've been describing the role of entrepreneur and entrepreneurs uh, has not always been like that. I think if I understood correctly, you have sort of the opposite view and that opened up the, the world of history for you as well. Can you elaborate a bit? Yes, that that's right. If I sometimes sound like a missionary when it comes to things like uh, entrepreneurship and global progress, it's because I have the... Um, 
missionary seal of a uh, convert <laughs> who started to believe in the opposite. Tiny marks is inside. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. And when I started to learn about the world, I the one thing I knew was that big things were bad and sort of big governments, but also big uh, business and industry really ruined the world, created uh, awful bad work environment and polluting the planet uh, as well. And I I wanted to believe that there were some good old days in the past when we live in, lived in harmony with one another and with nature. And I really only started to change when I learned history because you know i had thought of uh, of the past before the industrial revolution say as as a nice excursion to the countryside uh, that's that's much better than polluted cities right only i had thought that i would be able to carry you know antibiotics there and indoor plumbing <laughs> and maybe ipad as well <laughs> exactly my, my favorite bands and so on uh, when i read history i understood that that was not really the case and when i read up on my ancestors history in northern europe i realized that they didn't live ecologically they died ecologically because when they had bad weather over there they that meant starvation because they didn't have modern infrastructure they didn't have large scale trade they didn't have high yielding crops or artificial fertilizer and so on and so on and that got me interested in the the horrors of history and and understanding that i should be lucky to be alive right now because most people throughout history they had a life expectancy around 30 years and you know by now i'm older than that so i should be really grateful um to to this development um, 90% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty now it's lower than 9% despite incredible population growth and that got created an an unending obsession with progress and the the people and the institutions that make it possible because we cannot take it for granted because there is there's just a couple of g- few generations that have experienced this kind of of opportunities uh, that we take for granted and uh, now and then so that's perhaps that's why I'm a bit of a missionary what is your favorite word my favorite word um that my I love the word atmosphere. Um, it could be because it's an old Joy Division song I like, but it's also <laughs> something, uh, there's some sense of openness in it. And I like the sound of it, atmosphere. It's, it's, there's some openness in it. Or perhaps what, horizon, which is somewhat similar. What is your least favorite word? Can I mention a Swedish word? Yeah, because, absolutely. <laughs> because then I would say nipple, uh, which doesn't sound too <laughs> awful in uh, in English. But for some weird reason, in Swedish, it's called bröstvårta, which means breast wart, which is the worst possible word for a nice object <laughs> or an, a nice entity that I've I've ever come across. What turns you on creatively, emotionally, or spiritually? Now, I should say something um, because of my thesis about creativity, about sort of meeting interesting, surprising, talented, gifted people. Um, but that's not it. I think it's going out and uh, to run <laughs> and, and exercise, actually. Uh, I, I know it sounds very introverted, but that whole experience of, of doing it and letting the mind just flow um, without any particular object in mind and feeling the endorphins, that's that's when I get most creative. And if, and if I can't do that, a, a glass of wine might do it, that trick. What does you off? Hmm. I th- think that would have to be 
closed-minded people, and that includes myself in certain instances, and it includes people uh, who agree with me as well, but who face every new challenge and idea with um, with rejection. Just because I don't recognize it, it's bad. That's the that's the one thing that ruins everything. I think. What is your favorite curse word? Oh wow! I'm not a great cursor. Um, my father has a great curse word, and I use that once in a while. It might sound a little bit anachronistic, but it has a tremendous effect on people. And it's by Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that powerful? I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> What sound or noise do you love? I love the uh, sound of my espresso machine starting in the morning, my rocket machine. That brings joy to me. Uh, and, and wait a minute, no, another one. Uh, my cat, a Cornish Rex, when she's purring, making that purr sound, That's that might be even better. Sounds a little bit like an espresso machine, actually. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, you know the sound the computer makes when it doesn't agree with your command. <laughs> it yep. might differ from computer. Too well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too well. <laughs> exactly. It, it, and it differs a little bit from computer to computer, but it's like a kind of <clears throat> it's like instant feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not all feedback is. Crazy. You're failing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bad human. <laughs> yeah, complex system. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, uh, for a long time, I thought I should be a uh, musician uh, in an electronic music band, uh, like a craft work version. Uh, perhaps I, I would still like to try that, but I think it's closer now uh, to try something else, a little bit more humble. Uh, I'd love to have a kind of a book cafe serving coffee and wine and discussing books and having authors over for, for lectures. That would be my greatest water cooler experience of meeting creative people and 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 avoiding them by looking down into books when when i get fed up you should do that remotely just combining vault or vault you know the the service is done locally but you know it's remotely just connecting people yeah now well, that could work or perhaps a holodeck would make it even better or sponsorship from uh, rocket or any other great espresso machine provider <laughs> yes exactly that's the essential what profession would you not like to do I would hate to be a CEO of a uh, major company <laughs> because it's everybody else has a stake in you and you are responsible for everything. And I'm so impressed by people who, who managed to do it. Uh, I think I would drown in <laughs> and, and, and lose myself in that. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any era, which one would you choose? I'd love to be a co-founder of Plato's Academy in ancient uh, Athens and pick up great wow. pupils like high ambitions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pick up great <laughs> pupils like Aristotle and so on. Yeah, perhaps that's too high of an, an ambition. And they would see right through me. And that was a long establishment, wasn't that for many centuries? So it's probably the oldest company, you know, in, in a you know, course of history yeah. in that sense, almost. That that's right. Um, and you know, it wasn't really formed like a company, so perhaps it doesn't fit your description of a um, a startup like that, but. Uh, it yeah it worked for almost a millennia or something like that it took until the 530s or something like that when the Byzantian emperor shut down the academy because it philosophy threatened religion but being able to create something like that and you know having Plato there uh, but particularly pupils like Aristotle who would continue to sort of 
discover logic and uh, empirical sciences and uh, many of uh, the the great uh, humanities uh, that would be nice but i fear obviously yeah they would look right through me thinking what what's that guy doing here it's uh, how did he ever come into our band any final words for the audience well i gratitude i think is an underrated virtue being grateful for what we have we also have to be a little bit discontent because from discontent comes uh, progress uh, we want to solve problems but if we're not grateful for what we have then it's it's easy to despair and to become hopeless and to think that nothing ever really works nothing can be done about the problems that we have i think that's where we are when it comes to many issues in our uh, era lots of doom and gloom and the planet is going to be uh, end soon uh, and i often think about look where where would i have been had i been born in any other era if i had a time machine with a uh, ending up in arbitrarily somewhere else in time how how awful wouldn't life be if i ended up in the past uh, now if we look at the whole of homo sapiens existence as just 24 hours condense everything that has ever happened into 24 hours then everything that created the modern world and the modern lifestyle and our opportunities uh, our life expectancy uh, at more than 70 health wealth liberal democracy individual liberty all of those things came in the last 200 years and if we condense it to 24 hours that's just the last second so we've had some 86000 seconds when people didn't have that we were born and we live in that final wonderful second and if that doesn't uh, make you a little bit grateful for what uh, the world and existence and all the innovators entrepreneurs and eccentrics throughout history has given you then you're just a um, you're a little bit of a bad person i think thank you johan this was uh enormously fun and great and a bit hard journey as well and that's an inside joke just between uh, uh, two of us <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know exactly what you mean thank you so much petri this this was great fun thanks for listening if you want to know more about johan's books or even read my review of open check my website and you will find episode links and my book reviews i also have started to do youtube videos about entrepreneurial topics Check them out if you haven't already. Till next time.